And if you're not sure who your water provider is, you can go to the bewatersmart.info webpage where you signed up for these webinars and type in your address and you could get your water provider to see what programs they have available. Um, look forward to the presentation today. So I'll let Marlene take over. And if you have any questions, just feel free to give us a call. Thanks for your time today. All right, I am going to share my screen now. There we go. And we'll start it on slideshow. I'm beginning. There we go. All right. So we're ready to go, right? Monica, yes. everything looks good. Okay. Everything All right. Great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me. I've got my Madonna headset on. So I think that was from Vogue, her Vogue day. So hopefully you could hear me because I move my head a lot. Um, this is Planting for Pollinators, Pollinator Garden. And I'm Marlene Simon. I'm a horticulturalist at UC Davis, uh, the Botanical Conservatory, which we are normally open Monday through Friday, uh, nine to five. Hopefully we'll be open up in uh, fall again, of course, because we are close due to COVID. But of course, I go in every day because we have uh, plants there every day that need to be taken care of. We consider ourselves like a living museum. We have very rare plants, unusual plants. So let's get started. Um, oh, a few other places you can find me. My uh, podcast, Flower Power Garden Hour. Um, it's on Apple, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Google, any where you listen to top podcasts, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. I'm at Marlene, the plant lady, and there's an email you could find me at marlene.r.simon at gmail. So if you have any plant questions or anything, just email me there. All right. So we're going to talk about, of course, pollinators. We, we know how important pollinators are for our food. That's, you know, food supply, right? Uh, so many plants are pollinated by, by, uh, these pollinators we're gonna talk about. Also, it's a lot of these plants rely on being pollinated to carry on the next generation. So even if they're not food crops, they're important plants just for the ecosystem. So pollination is important um, in every regards as far as ecosystems go. But I always ask this question, especially to students, why do pollinators go to flowers? You know, we think of it from our side, well, we get food from them. Well, that's not why they necessarily go to, to flowers. They never wake up in the pollinators, never wake up in the morning and go, hmm, I think I'm bored. I'm going to go pollinate some flowers today. No, they, they've got plenty to do. So these are the four main reasons why. And I just have pictures to sort of demonstrate it. So over here, you could see the little bee and he has, of course, pollen on his legs. So yes, pollen. Pollen is a food source for a lot of pollinators. It is actually the original food source. But pollen is expensive to make as far as the plant goes. There's, you know, DNA, genetics, there's protein into it. So over time, plants evolve to provide pollinators and trick them to going for another food source, which this aloe is demonstrating is nectar. So some pollinators only seek out nectar from flowers. Some like bees will need both nectar and pollen. Uh, so uh, nectar is much cheaper to make. It's basically sugar and water. But does pollination happen when they're going for it? Of course. Now we get into uh, two other interesting ones that most people don't think about. Um, flies are number three pollinators in the world. Bees and wasps are number one, butterflies and moths number two, and then we have flies. And people don't think of flies as being great pollinators. And I joke it's because we plant bee gardens, we plant butterfly gardens, we plant hummingbird gardens. I don't know of anyone who plants a fly garden. And the main reason being is they're attracted to gross, disgusting things. Um, they're like, uh, take offense. Uh, so think of, you know, what do you, where do you see maggots? You see it on uh, dog poo. You see uh, maggots on dead, decaying things. Those are the offsprings of flies. So some plants and flowers have evolved to smell like death or poo. And the corpse plant is an example of one right here. Uh, this is probably about three feet tall. Uh, this is Amorphophallus titanum. This was at the conservatory a few years ago. So this inflorescence, uh, smells like a dead body and it's pollinated by flies and dung beetles. Beetles are also sometimes pollinators. So uh, they want to lay their uh, offspring 
on a food source of poo or something dead. They get tricked to go to the flower. They land, they lay their eggs, they take off, not great parents. That's the extent of their parenting. And then the flowers pollinated because the fly's been moving around. So trickery as far as thinking the offspring's going to get food. And then the fourth one is mimicry. See this little orchid right here looks like a bee. So a male bee or wasp is going to go, hmm, that looks like a potential mate and it's going to lay on it. And well, it's going to pick up the pollen and that's pretty much all it's going to get. Sees another one, gets tricked, lay on it. And then of course, pollen's going to be uh, then put on the flower and pollination. So looking for a mate, food for your offspring, nectar, pollen. Those are pretty much the four major reasons why pollinators go to flowers. We, of course, are going to be talking about these two right here pretty much is nectar and pollen, how to bring pollinators in by providing them nectar and pollen. All right, types of pollinators. I already talked about, you know, the number one bees and wasps and then, you know, flies and butterflies. Uh, we're going to start narrowing it down and talking about California. So the major types of pollinators you see in California, uh, different um, I don't know what happened to my number here. That's but should be 1,600 different species of bees in California. 1,600 different species, native bees, native bees. There's 170 to 200 species of butterflies, um, wasps. I don't know how many species of wasps there are, but think figs, right? That's how figs get uh, formed, is they're pollinated by wasps and they climb inside the 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 how the flower is forming. Uh, there's a lot of beneficial wasps as well. And we're not talking just the big uh, paper wasps that you see, but you know most of these wasps are pretty small and you're not going to be able to see them. Uh, moths, there's daytime not moths and um, nighttime moths. And I have a picture of a sphinx moth down uh, the way that you may not even realize you saw a moth. You might have thought you saw a hummingbird. Uh, there's two bats in California that I know of that are great pollinators, the long-nosed bat and the Mexican long-tongued bat. And yes, bats are pollinators. They tend to, uh, well, they need usually white flowers because they show up at night since they're nocturnal. So white shows up at night, bigger flowers and fragrant flowers and they're nectar seeking. So think of tubular flowers. So like Brugmansia, um, a lot of the jasmines will be pollinated by bats and birds, including around 10 species in California of hummingbirds that do pollination. Um, so there, there's a lot of pollination happening all around us. And of course, generally we see just the honeybees and think of honeybees, but they're you know not even native and they don't do generally the most um, pollination for us. General guidelines for pollinators. Okay, so what do they want and what you should you provide in your garden for them? So this is actually a picture of a swarm that just occurred in my garden last week. Um, so for those who don't know what a swarm, how that happens is I have two old walnut stumps and each year uh, bees come back to it. And in spring, when they decide that they're getting too big or for whatever reason, they swarm, a group of them will come out. There's a queen. They'll go find a spot. And what they do is when you see a swarm is they're just hanging on a branch or somewhere they're sending out scouts to find a good permanent spot. And they'll usually dissipate in a few days. This is when people call uh, beekeepers out to collect them because beekeep it's free bees, right? This is a free hive right here. Uh, what I did is I just let them do their thing and they, they went away. I have a bee box and I was hoping to entice them to the bee box. Um, but I keep losing my bees. I'm not a great beekeeper. <laughs> so I thought they'd be better off on their own. So I didn't force them in there. I'm like, if you go to inside the bee box, great. But if you don't, that's great. And apparently my bee box was not desirable. So they did not. So they were on there for about two days and left and they're very docile and calm while they're, while they're there. All right, so incorporate layers in a garden. And what I mean by this, and I'm gonna have pictures that show each one after I go through this list, is you want 
low plants, medium plants, and of course you want high plants because we're trying to entice different pollinators in and we're trying to keep pollinators. Remember pollinators have different life cycles throughout the, uh, the season. So some of, you know, like these bees right here, they may need just a branch other times than they need, uh, a, you know, a, a dead branch, something to go into birds. You know, they, they're going to build their nest up high, so they want something higher, but where are they going to eat? They're going to eat down below, the bugs down below. So incorporate layers. Don't just think of your garden as one single, maybe two, two foot tall hedge. All right, provide water. Most pollinators want a water source. Of course, they all need water and you can provide them that. And I'll, I have a few pictures that will show, um, you know, a pool is not necessarily a great source of water because what happens when they land in them, they drown. So you need water source, but you need it to be safe for the pollinators. Keep old plant debris for building material or dwellings. Now, you know, when I give a talk about pest control, it's usually if you have known pests, clean up those leaves underneath. If you're trying to grow a plant to its best ability, remove all the dead. So it's a balance. Of course, you want to uh, clean up your garden, but if you have an old stump, leave the stump. You know, it's not, it, it's breaking down. If you have a few dead branches on a healthy plant, go ahead and leave them. If you have a clean, pretty, pretty disease-free garden, leave, you know, a pile of, of, of leaves. So don't try to have this pristine garden because uh, these pollinators are using everything in your garden. Keep areas of ground free of mulch and debris. Now mulch is uh, the go-to for water conservation, um, weed control, adding nutrients to your soil, keeping your soil cool and the earthworms happy. But if you could keep certain spots it's clear of everything that helps the ground dwelling bees. And I think it's 70% of the bees in California are solitary and ground dwelling. Plant species, let's see here. I'm going to move this out of the way. Plant species in um, clusters. So easier for pollinators to feed and to see. So don't just have one plant of one, one lavender in one spot and then, you know, 15 feet away, plant another lavender. Think about putting three lavenders, you know, space so they could grow healthy, but equal distance um, close by. So when the pollinators see it, they see all that purple and they could just go uh, quickly to it. So think about grouping. Do not use pesticides. And believe it or not, this even includes certain organics. Um, Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, spinosad, and diatomaceous earth. I'm gonna go into these a little bit more, but those are three ones that are pretty popular and they're organic, but can cause problems to pollinators, believe it or not. All right, when you're planting, think generally single petaled flowers are better. So when you go to the nurseries, you see these petunias nowadays and they have just multiple petals or you go and you see these rubecchias um, and they just have multiple, multiple petals or even cosmos. You know, those are all hybridized to be really showy and have a lot of petals. But think about the single petaled ones because they generally have more pollen or the pollen is easier to see for the pollinators or the nectar. So the more hybridizing you get, the less, um, I'd say, pollinator friendly. And I don't know if you guys can hear my cats in the background. They're, uh, they're playing or beating each other up. <laughs> Oops. The last one, let me see, I just keep moving this thing around, is try to plant food for... Um, year round, right? Don't just think, oh, my bees need uh, food and nectar and pollen in spring. Think about year round, think about the fall, think about planting berries, uh, think about their breeding habitats. What do, what do birds need? Um, what do butterflies need? What do they need when they're uh, in different larval stages, right? So try to think year round as far as planning for a garden. All right, so this is what I mean by incorporate different layers. And I think we all sort of um, got this one, right? Let's go back right there. That, you know, you have a, a taller tree, you have a medium-sized shrub, you have even then lower shrubs, and then you could even have like ground covers down here, something really low. So you want to create 
just different layers. So the birds could go up here, the birds could eat down there, butterflies could, uh, you'd have a larval stage there, but when they're flying, go um, up here. So it's just, it's safety. It gives them more um, dwelling spaces. So here's the water. So on the left, this is my, 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 for my bees right here. Um, I think they prefer running water. So if you can have a little drip, you know, we're trying to save water, but if you have a little uh, fountain, that's great of circulating water. But I fill this up pretty much every morning, just a little bit. They like all the organic material in there that leaches out nutrients. And I put a stick in there because if the water gets, gets a little too high, they'll drown. So the stick right here, they're able to just use it as a safety net and they'll go, you know, if they end up in the water, they'll go on the stick. So it doesn't need to be pristine. Of course, you don't want to be put it by anywhere chemicals or anything could fall into it. Um, but provide them provide them water, ideally running water, if you can't, then just a little basin of water. Uh, so butterflies actually like something called puddlers, where, you know, they'll get water from something like this, but they actually need to get minerals. And if you've ever seen butterflies where on there in a sort of a muddy spot on the ground, and you're like, oh, they're getting water, but they're actually picking up a whole bunch of the uh, minerals from it. So I got this from butterflylady.com. And it's just a very shallow, this looks like a terracotta saucer, some sand, uh, make sure you use clean sand, not you know, cat litter sand, and then some pebbles, and then larger rocks for the butterflies to sit on. And there's water in there. And basically, they're going to siphon up the water, but the water is going to be nutrient rich, mineral rich, because it's gone through these rocks. So they call it a butterfly puddler. Of course, you can make one just very simple. All right, let's go to the next one here. Okay, so this is when you're leaving your dead debris. Old sunflower stalks are actually even great for uh, mason bees to go into. This was a giant sunflower I had last year. I just left the stalk because I couldn't pull it out, but it turns out it's great to leave. Uh, twigs, old logs, dead trees, leaf debris, and even seed heads. This is a milkweed is great for uh, your monarchs, but it also has an incredibly fluffy um, seed head that birds could use to build nests. So think about bird building material as well. Just the other day, I was looking out my window and we have this telephone line running across from the house and there was a string on it. And I'm like, how did that string get there? Well, it was string I was using in my garden and I think a bird must have picked it up, flew and then dropped it, needed probably took what it needed from it. I'm not saying put string out in your garden, but materials like that, that your garden gives you, um, don't remove them all. Um, so, so think like the birds, I'm sure we've all seen bird nests before and we're like, wow, that's interesting. Um, oh, where did they find that? So, um, just think across the board of what, what pollinators will need. All right. I just needed to show this cause this is one of the walnut trees that I have. And here's the bees that every spring they swarm and they go in there and I leave it it's perfectly fine. I'm sure there's so much honeycomb in there since they've been doing it years and years and years. Um, they don't hurt anyone. And right below it is where I have their water source. And I think this is where the one of the swarms came from. I'm sure they're like, we're out of here. They're going to go find a new place. So even old tree trunks. All right. So how you know, you could get a bee box, of course. Um, actually, Woodland has a uh, man lake, M-A-N-N -N lake, which is one of the biggest suppliers of bee boxes and bee supplies. It's right up in Woodland and you could just walk in there. Um, they have, the, you know, bee, bees are not the easiest to keep. There's mites that get them, but it, it is rewarding to get your own honey. But there's other bees that you should be trying to get into your garden. Uh, mason bees, carpenter bees. And I know my last talk, someone's like, why do you want to bring carpenter bees? And they're eating holes in my, in my house. Well, they're great pollinators and maybe build them a house so they don't attack your house. I'm sure you've seen the mason bee homes, which are basically just tubes of different sizes. And they go in there and they um, go through their different stages. You could build your own too. Get redwood uh, or cedar. Don't use pressure treated. 
um, or anything that's don't use railroad ties at all because as Creo, so, so redwood's a good one because it lasts a while and you want the holes to be four to six inches deep when you drill them. So the depth and do various size holes, three sixteenth, four sixteenth, uh, five sixteenth width, different widths uh, to incorporate incorporate different um, types of bees, different sizes of bees, and then just cluster them together. So I'm sure we all have scrap wood laying around. You could borrow a drill um, and just drill holes and put it somewhere where, of course, it's not going to fall over. A little bit shade. Shade is good, even though bees like to be out in the sun. Um, I'm going to just check the chat real quick. Uh, yes, I'll talk about which type of milkweed to use when I get to the, the pictures. Let's see here. All right, ground dwelling bees. As if you've ever gone hiking, I'm sure you've come across and seen the ground dwelling bees. A lot of people mistake them and think it's automatically a wasp nest when they see this. It's not true. Uh, like I said earlier, I think 70% are solitary, possibly ground dwelling. So even this is a little too much uh, debris around, but clear a whole entire spot around. You could even, you know, turn the soil over, add some sand, um, not necessary, but even get rid of the mulch, get rid of weeds, get rid of anything on top and just, you know, see what, what um, comes about. All right. And this is clustering same type of plants. This is a garden uh, where I work. This is the South African section. And this is the osteospermum, commonly called freeway daisy. If you've lived in Southern California, you know why it's all along there. And it'll spread on its own. It's a ground cover. Um, and here is a um, gazania relative. Can't remember the name right now. I should know this. But you know, we planted multiples together and it's very showy. And so that, that way, if the pollinator likes it, it's going here and then it's going right to there and look at all this. So planting clusters, if possible, um, just makes it a little bit easier for the pollinators. All right, and avoid pesticides. All right, so, you know, I don't use any pesticides outside in the garden. You really don't need to. There's very few pests that re require any pesticides. I always say that a hose blast is your best friend if the aphids have gotten out of control. Generally, that's just in spring. Um, but sometimes, you know, you do need to control something. Um, I know sometimes people have on their, their winter vegetables, they get the, uh, the cabbage looper and BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is the best thing for it. Well, or also BT is what's in mosquito dunks. But you notice here it's OMRI, it's or listed as organic, but this kills butterflies and moths in larval stages. So controls what, uh, worms and caterpillars on fruits. So don't use it in your ornamentals if you're trying to attract butterflies. Um, and if you have, you know, tomato hornworms on your tomatoes, hand pick them off. There's so few on your tomato. And yes, one of them could do a lot of damage. But if you think you have it, take the time, hand pick them off. I know people who feed them to their chickens or just throw them somewhere else. You don't need to go to the trouble of spraying BT for your tomato hornworm. So just be careful, even if it's organic, it's safe around people and pets, safe on edibles, doesn't mean it's not gonna harm other um, good bugs. Same with spinosids. Spinosid is another natural bacteria that occurs and you know it's, or, it's organic. There's OMRI again, but it is toxic to bees. So if you were to spray it on your cherry trees for a, uh, you know, a cherry fly and you spray it when the cherries are in flower and you have bees coming to it, you're killing off bees. So even if it's organic, just be careful about when and if you spray it and what's around. Diatonaceous earth, um, it's basically crushed up diatoms, glass really. Uh, it's great. You sprinkle it on your, your leaves of your plants for creepy crawlers. You could even sprinkle it on the soil and anything that's crawling around on the soil, anything that goes across it, it basically cuts them. Doesn't sound so nice, but it works. But say you put it on your leaves and it gets on your flowers. Well, anything that's going right to the flowers has just walked over this, just, just got this. Um, any 
good pollinators, and this goes for beneficial insects too, of course, we're talking about pollinators, but beneficial insects that are around. Um, so just be careful, even soap sprays. You know, it's a soap spray. You spray it on a small um, wasp that's a pollinator, it's, it's still soap on them. It could still hurt them. So just think about what you're doing in the garden. Don't just assume because it's organic, it's, it's going to be okay. Um, Cause that's, that's not the case here. All right, and not all damage of ba is bad, of course. So I get questions about this. This is on a rose and people are like, oh my gosh, what's, what's eating my rose? Well, when you have perfectly half circles like that, that's a leaf cutter bee. That is a, well, there's an aphid right there, but that is perfectly fine. What they're doing is they're taking leaves and they're going back and they're building their nest with it. So this is a very distinct one. What not all damage caused by pollinators is as distinct, but don't worry, your plants could absolutely, any rose could overcome this damage. So um, just be aware that not all damage is bad and most plants could handle damage by even pests, let alone good pollinators. All right, so what do certain pollinators need? What, what should you plant for them? Before I go through the whole list, and um, I just sort of want to talk about generalization, right? So hummingbirds, and we're going to talk about hummingbirds versus other birds. Um, they prefer red flowers, but they will eat at any color flower. But first, they'll go to red flowers. So that's their favorite, right? I go to, you know, the chocolate glazed donuts before I go to the sprinkle donuts. But trust me, I'll go to the sprinkle donuts. They need to visit about 1,000 to 2,000 flowers a day. That's insane, 1,000 to 2,000 flowers a day. They can revisit some of the flowers. Now, if you've ever seen a hummingbird, it spends a few seconds at a flower. And you're like, oh, it's not getting anything. Well, flowers are smart. Flowers are not going to fill up their whole entire flower with nectar. They don't, you know, their whole point is to get the hummingbird uh, to visit the flower, accidentally pick up pollen, and then go to other flowers and disperse that pollen. So hummingbirds have to work extra hard to get enough nectar to support themselves. So 1,000 to 2,000 flowers a day, they can come back because some flowers can reproduce uh, nectar in a flower. Not all flowers can. For nesting material, plant manzanita and elderberry. Now, it's easier said than done for manzanita. Manzanita, Arctostaphylus, is very... Um, well, basically it prefers really, really good drainage. So if you're in most standard urban areas, it's gonna be hard to keep manzanita alive, but there's certain varieties um, like the strawberry tree um, is, a, is technically manzanita arbutus and elderberry. Elderberries could be pretty large shrubs. There's some that are now um, uh, cultivars that are showy, um, but they're great for nesting material. And for hummingbirds, think, tubular flowers. They're after nectar. Where is nectar at? In tubular flowers. So think of it as sort of like a little cup. So when you're shopping, red tubular flowers that ideally produce a lot, but you know, not necessary. And then things for their, their nesting. So that's hummingbirds in a nutshell. Uh, bees. Well, bees gather both nectar and pollen. So there's a wide, wide variety of plants for bees. They do need a landing pad though, meaning they don't hover like hummingbirds will hover. They need to land on a flower. They're attracted to various colors of flowers, especially white, yellow, blue, and that ultraviolet blue. And you can see this bee right here. Look at all of its pollen on its leg right there. And this right here is in my garden from this winter. This is broccoli that I let go to flower. You know, I harvest broccoli and then towards the end of the season when the heads start getting smaller and smaller, I let it go to flower. It's late winter, very early spring when not many other things are in bloom and the bees absolutely love it. Actually, I just pulled it out because it all went to seed, but it sustained bees for weeks and weeks, if not months. So sort of think outside the box sometimes about what, what bees like. Butterflies, okay, they do need a landing pad as well, right? They can't hover. They gather nectar, so think tubular flowers. And a lot of times we may not even be aware of what tubular flowers are. You could see here, you're like, well, that's not a tubular flower. Well, each of these individual true flowers has a tube 
And so there is nectar in there. So they need, you know, smaller flowers than what a hummingbird would need. You know, they land on this, this is a landing pad, and then they stick their little proboscis into each of these flowers. Plant for larval stages, not just for nectar. So, and I'll get into that in a little bit. And they're attracted to yellow, orange, red, purple, and pink. So they also have a wide variety. And I think they like a, a sweet smell, slightly nectar smell. Same with um, uh, hummingbirds. And I didn't talk about, I didn't add anything um, for moths. Um, but I think I mentioned before that moths and bats, you know, they're, they're not, for the most part, moths are nocturnal. So think white flowers, they're after uh, nectar. So think tubular flowers. And because at night, the fragrance is really key for them. So that's why I mentioned the, um, a lot of the uh, jasmines. All right, so here's a few websites that are great resources sources for uh, bigger plant lists than what I'm going to show, um, what things plants, uh, pollinators need, monarchwatch.org. We know that monarchs are decreasing like crazy. Um, so, so this is really specific to the monarchs. This is a nursery down in Monterey area, Las Palitas, but they have a great website. Um, for pollinators. Beegarden.ucdavis.edu. If you've never been to the bee garden on campus, you could just walk right in. It's uh, west of campus. Um, and they just, you know, it's laid out with, with all their uh, uh, plants that bees like. It's, I guess it's the hog and doss. And that picture of the mason bees and the other blocks, that's where I took that picture of. The Xerces.org, they have a great uh, it's a great resource for pollinators and audubon.org is great for hummingbird gardens and bird gardens and what birds need. And this was me checking on my, my bees last year, um, which I lost. I'm not a good beekeeper. All right, so I'm just gonna show you two quick pictures of um, some gardens that are great pollinators. And then we'll get into the individual flowers that I think are great ones for pollinators and are water wise and will uh, do great in your garden. So this is my previous garden. I think this was obviously with the poppies, it was towards the end of spring coming into summer. Bachelor's button, easy annual. Um, this was a weedy verbena, bonariensis, larkspur, easy annual. Um, I don't think I have those on my list, but um, you know, they're clustered, clustered, clustered. So just the pollinators could see. This is a friend's garden I just took this year. She took out her lawn and she replaced it with drought tolerant plants. And a lot of those drought tolerant plants are great for uh, pollinators. I'm gonna talk about this verbena later, poppies of course, um, calliandra, which is a uh, rock purslane. And so let's go into it. I, I started, I organized this by more seasons. I didn't want to do it by like birds and hummingbirds and butterflies, just because a lot of them overlap and they work for multiple different pollinators. So I try to do it as best as I can with seasonality. And I'm going to start with aloes because aloes are great when nothing else is blooming in uh, December, January, and February. They're great for hummingbirds. Now, I know people feed their hummingbirds supplement with hummingbird feeders. Um, I think on one of those sites, they're explaining how you don't want to just do that, give them sugar water. They need protein. They need the complex sugars. And I didn't know this at all, um, but I was talking to a hummingbird expert and you know we don't need to worry about this so much in California, but in the throughout the whole entire world, there is some nectar that is toxic to certain hummingbirds. There is some a nectar that only certain hummingbirds will eat, and then there's universal nectar. So that just ensures that the right pollinator goes to the right flower, and pollination happens. So these plants are pretty much narrowed in what they want their pollinator to be. Um, so remember, not all nectar is the same and definitely sugar water is not, not the best for hummingbirds. You could supplement, but really plant nectar is great. So aloes bloom late in the summer. I mean, late in the winter, they're still blooming now. So it's a long bloom period. Um, like with any plant, make sure you, you check the cold tolerance. There's certain aloes that do great. Um, the coral aloe, 
um, which is an awesome one handles cold just fine but aloe vera which isn't a great one for out in the garden because it's from place in south africa that gets a little bit colder and a lot of times people have their aloe vera die out on them um so you know just shop around but for the most part hummingbirds aloes drought tolerant doesn't need to be watered all summer long Ribe sanguinium, this is a native, this is a native gooseberry, it bloom, it already bloomed, so it has a quick short bloom period, but for hummingbirds it's great when nothing else is blooming, I think it bloomed in, I want to say late February, early March, um, it was blooming with ceanothus, this year the ceanothus bloomed a little bit later I noticed, um, so ribe sanguinium, taller shrub, partial shade is great for this one, but it also provides gooseberries. So in the fall, birds are going to be able to eat it. Um, so when nothing else is blooming, this is, this is a nice one to have. Speaking of ceanothus, it was blooming and it's still blooming. This one is just, you go by it and the bees are just everywhere. I'm talking carpenter bees and, um, all the other numerous bees, 1600 different bees. I'm not a bee expert, so I couldn't tell you all the bees, but um, spring blooms, you can't really beat it. Now, I mentioned in my, my, my Mediterranean talk that ceanothus, they grow really fast. They need really good drainage or they could just die suddenly. Um, they, if they're in a wet area, they just get stressed and stressed. And then one day the plant will just be dead. So be careful where you plant it, even plant it on, on a mound even, um, to get that extra drainage, but it's well worth it just for the amount of pollinators around it. Facilia and Leia. So the front one is Facilia and the back one is Leia. These are both California native annuals that will just reseed and reseed and you could see it's just taken over this area um, you throw the seeds down in fall hopefully fall and winter rains will water them in and then you don't really need to plant them again because they'll just keep uh, coming back they're starting to die down and go to seed now but my gosh when i walked by this the bees um, were just crazy and butterflies for the laeas because it's a nice open flower um, so those are two California native annuals that I would really recommend. Lupin, okay, that's another one, right? Here's a, a giant carpenter bee here going to lupins. Um, they also reseed. There's different lupins. There's very small lupins and there's taller ones. There's even bush lupins that are perennials. Those are a little bit harder to keep growing because same thing as the, the drainage, just like the little guy right there. Nicotiana, and I put this in early in the season because mine didn't stop blooming all winter long. It was up against a metal wall, so it was on a south side, so it stayed warm. But Nicotiana, look at that long tube right there. So bats and nighttime moths that have the long proboscis um, could go to this Nicotiana. And this one also will reseed as well, and it has a nice fragrance at night. So that's what the night, night pollinators are after. They come in different colors, but I do recommend the white for if you're trying to get the nighttime pollinators. And something pollinates it because it does set seed. I never see it because I'm not there at night. Uh, Callistamin, uh, this one I love. So this is bottle brush. This one's neon pink. I love the pink. So this was in the bee, the haagen bee garden. Um, so all along here, of course, is um, is little little bits of the pollen that they uh, the bees will get and uh, transfer and move around. This one is a little bit smaller um, than your standard uh, bottle brush, which could get pretty darn tall. This one was only about, I want to say, four to five feet tall, which seems big, but compared to the other one, it's smaller. But neon pink, I love the pink, very showy. So it's not a native, but to get year round interest and to really plant for the pollinators and have those flowers, you know, a lot of our natives in the summer are done. You know, they rely on winter rains, spring comes, that's when they put their blooms out and then they sort of go into the sort of a, eh, you know, it's, we're stressed for water, we've already bloomed. So it is good to incorporate Mediterranean plants and plants from similar zones to get those uh, year round interest of flowers. 
Aristolochia California. Now, this is not the easiest one to get established. It grows along wet riparian streams. We do have a few we got established in pots even at the conservatory, so it's doable. And the reason why I put this one here is it is larval food for the pipe vine swallowtail. So um, it's not necessarily going to get any nectar off of it, but the larvae, the eggs will be laid and then the larvae. So pipe vine, so it's a native pipe vine and the pipe vine swallowtail will use this as a host plant. So this is a vining plant. Um, it's native. I, I got this picture off of Flickr. Thank you, Josh M. He took this up at Stebbins. Uh, Coal Canyon. So it grows along the streams there. So this is where I was talking about planting also for um, butterflies so they could um, go through their larval stage in the chrysalis. Passion vine, same with that. The, fritil the Gulf Fritillary it uses our passion vines and it will decimate the whole entire plant. At the conservatory, there's like no foliage on them at all, but it's okay it bounces right back. They're vigorous vines. If it goes in healthy, it's going to be able to tolerate it. And the gulf fritillary is they just lay there, the larvae come out, they eat the whole entire plant. Then the plant just puts on um, more leaves. And bees and butterflies love the flowers of passion vine as well. So if you want the edible one, that edible one is Passiflora edulis. Not all passion fruits are edible. In fact, some are highly poisonous. So um, just be careful about that. Salvia bees bliss. Well, with a name like that, of course, you expect it to be covered in bees, and it is. This is a larger, uh, wider salvia. It gets maybe about two, three feet tall, but could get six feet wide. Now is its peak bloom time, um, covered in bees, but also, you know, butterflies would like this. Um, if they could land, it's not the easiest one for them, but I have seen them on it because it is a tubular individual flower. So salvia bees, bliss. there's a lot of salvias, salvia clevelandii, um, salvia gregii, I think I have a picture of that, that bees love. Another salvia, uh, salvia spathaceae, this one is hummingbird sage. So with a name like that, you know, hummingbirds, you, you have the pink calyx, right? So these aren't the flowers. These are the individual flowers here, but this acts to just attract the pollinators because it's pink. So it looks like there's more flowers than there is, but there's enough uh, tubular flowers. Um, so the hummingbirds are able to um, just hover and get the uh, nectar there. And this one's nice because it takes a little bit of shade. Um, all day filtered light, morning, sun, afternoon shade, great for under large trees that you uh, drought tolerant and it'll spread, it'll creep along and spread. So it could cover a pretty big area, big, long uh, bloom period as well. Pucara, another dry shade plant for hummingbirds. This is a native coral bells and it is great planted in a big swath. One, I think it looks better. And two, get those pollinators uh, attracted to it. But it has a light light pink tubular flowers that hummingbirds really like. Uh, dry shade under a large tree. So uh, hookera sanguinea, but there's a whole bunch of different hookeras. A butylon. This is called flowering maple. Uh, it's not a maple. It's a large tree, uh, large shrub small tree and comes in all different colors of flowers um, but the pinks and the reds are great for uh, your hummingbirds and i've also seen bees at them because look at that pollen so the bees are able to land big bees land on there and, and gather the pollen but even though it doesn't look like a tube there is little drops of nectar down at the base it's a uh, it's a hibiscus relative and even though hibiscus don't look tubular they have a little bit of nectar that uh, nectar seekers are after. Long bloom period. In fact, we have one at work that we cultivate called uh, Clementine. And the shrubs that are on the west side of a building, so it gets blazing hot sun, has not stopped blooming in the 13 years I've worked at the conservatory. 13 years of nonstop bloom. And that one's called oh, Clementine. I'm still on the Zoom and I, I lost it there. I see it. Oh. Um, I hear someone. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully someone went on a mute. Uh, cat mint. 
Yes. So this is a low growing. There's one called uh, Walker's Low. Um, but any of the nepetas, the cat mints, have long bloom periods. Bees like. I've even seen um, uh, butterflies at them. Uh, long bloom period. If you have cats, yes, they'll go to it. It's not cat mint, but same genus. And so cats will really like. In fact, I looked out my neighbor's yard once and I saw my cat just sprawled dead center, just eating away at it. So if you have cats, be careful about, they will eat it, but uh, a great one for bees, really low water requirements, great for under roses, trimming areas in, um, in uh, sort of edging your garden. Verbena. So I mentioned the Verbena bonariensis. That's great for butterflies. It could be pretty weedy, uh, reseed, which, you know, not bad, but this is a native one, Verbena lilacina, a nice round shrub, always in bloom, constant bloom. So this one I could have put anywhere. I could have put it in winter. I could have put it in spring. It's always blooming. I showed you a picture of the butterfly that was on it because it has the tubular flowers, this uh, pale lavender color that uh, butterflies really like. Uh, drought tolerant, um, but really, uh, I, I want to say it's an it plant right now, uh, but it's, it's worth it. It's one that's going to stick around for a long time. So you could see my close up of the butterfly I just took. All right, so another one that I could have had early in spring and put pretty much year round is the California fuchsia, Joshneria. Low meaning only about maybe 18 inches to two feet tall, but it could spread eight feet. So if you have a big, dry, sunny area that you, you know, want to plant with flowers constantly, I recommend this one. The flowers are the orangish red, but hummingbirds absolutely love them because it's perfect. It's exactly what they want. The red, the tubular, lots of the flowers. Um, this picture I got from Annie's annuals. I don't know if they're propagating it anymore, but it's pretty common to find at almost any nursery. Okay, we have a few here. So this is where I'm going to talk about the milkweed. Um, for the monarch. So Asclepius is the genus of milkweeds. This one happens to be speciosa. This is a native one. It's called showy milkweed. Now, a lot of different milkweeds can be hosts for the monarchs. Um, they lay their eggs, their larvae come out and they eat the leaves. And of course, you know, butterflies are around. It's also great for nectar, but you do have to be careful about the milkweed that you use. There are tropical milkweeds. There's one called uh, Asclepius, I want to say uh, tuberosa is one of them. They're usually bright orange. The problem with them is they bloom so long that they could bloom into the season when monarchs are supposed to be migrating. And they're like, uh, why migrate? I, I'm here. So you, if you have those in your garden, you could still have them, but cut them down, remove the flowers, remove the plant, cut it down to entice the monarchs to um, migrate. And if possible, plant the native um, milkweeds. And this is, I mean, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's much better than the tropical milkweeds. Um, nice, slight fragrance. It will spread, but not horribly. And this is the one where I said, leave the, some of the seed heads because the birds could use them. Um, so that one's Asclepia speciosa. There's narrow leafed milkweed as, as well. And then yarrow. This is the native yarrow here, which is white, great for uh, butterflies and bees as well. And then another salvia, salvia gregii. Comes in different colors as well. Just a very low maintenance, easy to grow uh, salvia. Uh, this is not an aloe. It's a Hesper aloe. And it's from Baja. And planted in clusters, it looks really nice, very low drought tolerant, but these spikes are over six feet tall. And so that's a lot of flowers really high up. So it's great for the hummingbirds. It's that red tubular color. So it's a long bloom period, but you can't beat it if you need an area or have an area that you don't want to water a lot, full sun, um, not great soil. Um, go ahead and plant this and the hummingbirds will just be at it all the time. So pretty common at most nurseries to find Hesperello. Another yarrow, I just wanted to show the different colors that they come in. Um, the native yarrow spreads a lot. Uh, some of the new hybrids are more upright and they don't spread quite as much, but you could see this one I think was called paprika. Um, so butterflies like it, bees also like it. 
landing pad for both. I like the yarrow called Moonshine. It's a uh, bright, bright yellow. Uh, bull bean. This is a, another plant that I could have put in from spring until fall because the bloom period is so long. Um, this one I took in the bee garden at Davis. So it's definitely planted for bees. Bright yellow. You could see all that pollen there. So the bees are just all over it. It does spread and spread and spread. So you don't even have have to worry about planting it in clusters, it'll spread for you. And you could just easily dig it up and give away pieces or put them in your compost bin. But a really low water, easy to grow a bee plant. Um, two low growing ones, this tucrium, I, I can't um, stress enough how many bees are on it when it's in full bloom. And it's so strange, I took this picture and there's not a single bee on it, but trust me, it's just covered in bees. Um, and this is a, uh, a yellow, so right next to, right next to purple is yellow, great combination. So, um, but yeah, I love this two cream. There's other two creams. There's two cream uh, fruticans, which is the bush germander. It gets about four feet tall and it's also great for bees. It has a lighter blue color on it, but I like this one if you're looking for something low. see. Ah, so here's the picture of the sphinx moth. So this is actually a moth. It's not a hummingbird. Uh, it's out during the day and you can see it almost looks like it has a beak like a, a hummingbird and it hovers like a hummingbird. And so versus other moths that are out during the day. So if you see, you know, really big uh, larvae on your plants, it could be one of the sphinx moths. But I mean, it's was looking at this, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. It's on this Penstema heterophilus, Margarita Bop, which is a native that has very iridescent blue flowers. So bees also love this. I This is one of my favorite all-time flowers plants. It's pretty low, only gets 18 inches tall, maybe two feet wide, but the iridescence of the blue is just pretty stunning. Long, long bloom period and uh, covers multiple pollinators. Uh, I think hummingbirds I've seen at it even, uh, carpenter bees, honeybees, and of course even moths. There you go, I have another picture of it there. You could see the iridescence color. So low water, good drainage, um, found at almost any nursery. Um, pretty popular, gaining popularity too. Artichoke. So I mentioned before that I let my, my broccoli and some of my winter veggies go to flower. So when there's not a lot blooming in late winter, just let some, you know, your radishes go to, to flower and you'll have just bees that are looking for foraging in, in the winter. Artichokes, another one, you know, artichokes are the buds, the flower buds you eat. But I know when I artichokes, there's only so many you could eat and give away. And sometimes, you know, you get lots of aphids on them and you're like, okay, I don't even want to harvest that anyways. Let it go to flower, beautiful flowers and bees really like it. Hum uh, butterflies really like it. Um, very, very showy. And the, uh, the seeds have a little fluff to them too. So birds could even use them in for nests. So, you know, think outside the box a little bit about, about what could go to flower and what bees might like. And zinnias, zinnias are, they're just the happiest flower. Um, always blooming, you know, start them and direct sow them now. You could buy six packs, but I prefer seeds so you could get the taller ones and different varieties, or you could start them inside right now. They start blooming uh, late spring all the way through fall, constant blooms. And you could see, even though these ones are, you know, hybridized, these are the individual little flowers right here. So there's a lot of flowers per each flower. Um, they did a study, and most the two families that bees will go to the most are Asteraceae, which is the daisy family and the Lamiaceae, which is the mint family. So think, you know, lavenders and rosemaries and sages. Um, so this is in the Asteraceae family. So there's a lot of little flowers in one big quote flower there. Uh, long bloom period, you'll have butterflies, you'll have bees, everyone will be happy. And a late fall, well, I should say early fall, late summer is the native aster, this aster chilensis, covered in bees. So when things are fading and there's not as many fl spring flowers, summer flowers, asters start doing their thing and they're just covered with flowers, lots of, um, you know, buds forming while these flowers. So it's a long bloom period and bees just go crazy. So 
Um, that's when I also let oregano, even culinary oregano, uh, go to flower. Bees absolutely love oreganos of all different types. So generally late uh, fall, I'll let oreganos go to flower and bees will be all over the asters and oreganos. They're very happy. And I just wanted to point out too that you're going to plant for uh, berries as well. So toy on it. Um, this is from Mostly Natives Nursery, heteromelis. Uh, so th this is a food source for birds. Uh, Calicarpa, it's not a native, but it has these iridescent purple. It's called beauty berry. This picture, it's weird. It, it doesn't show the iridescence here. When I took it and before I put it on the computer, it was very iridescent. But um, so think berries as well. There's a, a winter berry, a, um, a native. So just think native berries. Think let things go. Nandinas even. You can let nandinas go to, go to fruit. So not only does it give your garden a good interest, it actually provides food for the birds as well. So don't just think flowers, think of uh, year round. And I think that's, that is all I have there. So I'm gonna check the chat. I'm gonna stop sharing that. And where's chat? Um, bee houses on the ground. Are there any of the bee pollinator plants mentioned so far edible for people? Um, so I sort of did mention, yes, um, you know, I mentioned lavender is edible, rosemary, and these ones I didn't show pictures, but I mentioned um, your oreganos, yeah, the artichokes, the um, all your winter vegetables, um, yeah. So well, actually, a lot of bee uh, uh, that we eat are are um, for bees as well. So yeah, it's it's endless. So think the mint family. Pretty much anything in the mint family, a lot of that is edible, and that. Uh, we could eat. Uh, bee houses on the ground. So for the mason bees, no, you want them up high. Even your, your beehive shouldn't be on the ground. They should be elevated up, um, if that's what you mean. Oh, um, thank you, Debbie. Uh, Zoom is very bizarre because I like to tell really bad jokes. And I had to stop doing that because no one would laugh back at me. It would just be like me in, in the screen and it was sort of sad, but no. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's interesting to do talks on Zoom. There's not a lot of feedback. <laughs> so um, any other questions? One new message? I, yep. Okay, good. I'm glad you laughed and smiled. I don't know if my cat made it on one of my, I have five cats inside and uh, sometimes they make it on. Sometimes they knock things over, but. Any other questions? I think I still, oh, I got two minutes. That was pretty good timing. Yeah, will the post slide? Um, yes, I think they're gonna post it. And it, it's good that the, the headset worked. Last time we had um, audio issues. So it could have been um, internet. I went to a better place, better internet. Um, so. Marlene, if I can interrupt. Of course you can. A copy of this presentation will be posted at bewatersmart.info backslash webinars. And it'll probably be posted either late today or early tomorrow. Okay. And yeah, if anyone also has any other questions, um, marlene.r.simon at gmail. Um, you can post questions on um, Instagram and Facebook. I get to them. Give me a little bit of time. Um, so, but, you know, if you're not sure if a plant is good for bees and I just want to throw this out that I, um, and I should have put this in there and, and I'm pretty sure this is correct. I need to verify, but, uh, like Buckeyes, California Buckeyes are toxic to honeybees. So go figure. Um, so just remember not everything is just straight across the board, but that's why you'll never see Buckeyes in a, in a bee list because they are toxic to, to honeybees. So. Yeah. All right. Any last questions right. before we get kicked off the Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. All right. And um, could you repeat the name of the milkweed that was really good? I, I was writing it down. Okay. Uh, Asclepius speciosa, uh, the showy milkweed, but there's a lot of different native milkweeds. Um, the ones you want to avoid are the tropical milkweed. So Asclepius 
Uh, tuberosa is not a good one. So the ones that are more orange are not good. Um, and there's a narrow leafed milkweed too, but I find the speciosa the easiest one to grow in, in a garden. Okay, perfect. It's one o'clock. Thank you everybody All for right. attending. And thank you, Marlene. We love having thank you. We do webinars, right. they're fabulous. I always learn a lot. Good, good, I appreciate it. All right, thanks. Bye everyone. And I'll see you guys later. Bye.